I prayed to God that he would let you marry me. And then I also prayed to God that he would help me get over you. So if you haven't heard, I'm going through a divorce. And divorce is a lot like death. I've, ex I've experienced a lot of that in my life. You have to grieve and you have to get some grasp on understanding. And on Monday, we will have been married 14 years. We will have been together in April for over 20. And as weird as this may sound, it's almost like I'm grieving and mourning the brother-sister aspect of our relationship or the friendship aspect more than the romantic aspect because if you know anything about Disney movies, Ohana means family and family's forever, especially the family you pick. If I run out of gas on the side of the interstate and I call him, no matter how many times I call, no matter how sad I am, no matter how alone I am, he's not coming. And he's told me that and he's shown me that. And I'm having the hardest time accepting that. He's not my family anymore. Where am I going to be buried? Who's going to bury me? That's the hard part. The unconditional love wasn't unconditional. And he doesn't want to be my family. He doesn't care about me no matter how mad he gets at me or aggravated like he used to because it's not unconditional. That's the hardest part. Losing my family. Losing my friend. I don't need another slow kiss or a love song dedicated to me. I need someone to show up with a gas can when I run out of gas. I miss having a best friend. I mean, that's what happens when you go to, when you go to a divorce is you guys aren't responsible for each other anymore. Wherever your responsibility was, whoever it was to before, prior, then that's who it goes to. I don't know what's going on here. I understand, I understand where she's coming from. She's mourning the fact that this is the way that it's been for, what, 20, over 20 years uh, prior to us being married. Like, this is the way it was. And even though we're getting rid of the romantic part of it, then I still would want us to be friends to where you are my family. I, I mean, we just, we're just friends now, but I would want you to be there for me if there was some trouble in my life or if I needed to be buried or whatever it is. And I would have your back because, I mean, at this point, that's, we're all we have, but once again, and probably something that you'd see me talk about in the end of the video at the very end is if you're going so hard for this type of thing, why not do it in the relationship? I don't get it. It's like these types of women think that once you separate, then the man is obligated. Not saying that he won't, but the man is obligated. And even you, you're not obligated either to take care of him. You guys have decided this relationship is not working. We're going to go do our own thing. He's not obligated to continue spending time with you, to can you continue taking care of you. Now, if you were in like a terrible, terrible situation, could you call him? Probably. But what modern women and strong, independent women say is, well, we don't need you to change a tire because we have things like roadside assistance, AAA, and that is true, right? And so you alienate yourself when you say things like that, because sometimes AAA or whatever roadside assistance, towing assistance you have, 
they take a long time to get there and you don't know them. I mean, you guys might have gone through your things, but you know this guy, you're comfortable with this guy, at least that he's not going to do anything to you. But when you separate, he's under no obligation to continue doing that for you. So I get where you're coming from, but let the grieving begin because this this is something that you have actually, unfortunately, put yourself through. I'm divorced. Of course I gave up on my marriage out of nowhere and he was totally shocked when I finally said I wanted a divorce. I'm divorced. Of course I'm a gold digger and now I'm living my life carefree. <laughs> I'm divorced. Of course I'm damaged goods and a red flag. Run, boys. I'm divorced. Of course I didn't try counseling before filing for divorce. <laughs> I'm divorced. Of course I'm the villain because I chose to end it, even though they would have stayed in a miserable marriage for 10, 20, 30 years. <laughs> I'm divorced. Of course it's because I don't understand the true meaning of commitment these days anymore. Ah, chivalry is dead. I'm divorced. Of course I'm going to brag about it on the internet like it's a flex. I'm divorced. Obviously I stopped drinking, stopped binge eating, and started working out every day and had a total glow up. I'm divorced and I post about it on the internet, so I should just be okay with all the bullying that I receive for being divorced. I've never made a video talking about why I wanted divorce, so I guess let's dive into it. Because on my get ready with me video that's got millions of views, a lot of people are like, step one for weight loss, divorce him. And no, no, that's not like what my intentions were with that video. That's just sadly part of my story. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Lauren. I'm a weight loss influencer and I lost 87 pounds and also happened to get divorced. So let's go way back to the beginning. I met my ex-husband in college my first semester in 2014. We got married May 1st of 2017. We were in college at Missouri State at the time and he just like grabbed my promise ring and asked me to marry him and then a week later told me he wanted to join the army. So, which we had been dating for three years. I loved him. He was like the love of my life. So I said, yes, like love is all we need, right? So I dropped out of college. I got my associates in general studies, but like never finished my bachelor's at Missouri State and went on to become an army wife and got it in my head that I needed a baby instantly since I was leaving my family to go move like somewhere in the country, which what was wrong with me? I was 21 years old and like demanding a baby. Anyway, son was born in March of 2018 and by March of 2020, I wanted a divorce. Our marriage just started feeling like we were roommates. Like we literally didn't have any intimacy. We didn't seem to have much in common anymore. Like we didn't even like listening to the same music. We didn't have fun together anymore. He had his own struggles with mental health during our whole relationship. And I like, it started to rub off on me, which sounds so bad, but I tried to take care of his needs for so long. Like I would literally wrap this man up in blankets and give him baths and wash his whole body and like hold him tight in Walmart. Like I did a lot of things for him. And then when I was struggling, where was he for me? I love this man. I was literally obsessed with him. Letting our relationship get to like that roommate level is what really, well, what really ruined it. And I tried telling him. He'd come home from work and just instantly sit in his recliner and be on his phone. And I said, hey, like, I need attention. I'm starting to be unhappy. Oh, okay. Weeks. This story. I literally just got divorced.
he was your best friend, the person you love the most, you wouldn't abandon him. What bothers me is that she portrays herself as a victim. When you hear a woman's divorce story, there's always background music and the sad tale of the damsel in distress who escaped from the cave of the big bad wolf. Just say, I got divorced because I want to try with someone else. This woman said something that leaves us evidence. I did all the work, the research. What does that tell us? That she searched for all the evidence, consulted with a lawyer, and when she had everything to screw the man over, she filed for divorce. That's what she prepared for, the way to get the most benefit after the divorce. This is why men don't get married anymore. You can't enter a lifelong business where your partner receives more benefits for leaving the business than staying with you. That woman was my friend, the man I love the most, my safe place. If you do this to the person you love the most, may God spare me from being your enemy. Don't be fooled by tears because she can look at you crying while still stabbing you in the back. As we all know, women are always the victims. <laughs> Oh, it's funny because it's true. Listen, I got wife material written all over me. I just keep picking dudes that can't bleed. I've waited for my husband for so many years. And I'm just getting mad. And I'm about to turn 40. There's a lot of stress on me right now. I know it's all you've got to just be strong. And just try to keep it together. I know you think that you are too far. But we're came back normal. Hormone levels are normal. So we're going to proceed is never with uh, the process of Hope is never building these things. Hold on. <laughs> Don't let go. Oh. I actually have another injection. Hey, hey, hold on. Don't let Single women are the happiest. This is sad. It's very pitiful. These treatments are very expensive besides they don't have a guarantee of getting pregnant. So they can end up losing the money. This is the current fate of many women. Do you believe this woman didn't find a man in her life who wanted to be with her? If she did... Because almost all women always had simps circling around wanting a relationship with her. But this woman is growing up with this female empowerment that keeps telling her you deserve a high-value man. You deserve a man who earns so much. The man who dates you has to invest. Don't date men with a minimum wage. All that nonsense that ends up resorting to this. Or ends up alone with a cat. This is the tough part of the wall. I'm not saying it as a mockery. But it's reality. Women come with a biological clock. If they let time pass, it runs out. That's why women shouldn't focus on a job or riding the carousel with Chad. They should rather bet on a man's potential to form a couple. Because once they hit the wall, they realize that being single doesn't make them happy. That the wall doesn't forgive. This is probably why I'm going to be single. Forever. Not really by choice. It's not about being insecure. It's about staying the fun lane. Because honestly, when it comes to the whole finding a wife thing, a lot of men want women to cook and clean. I'm just like not going to fucking clean cook like i've been eating canned tuna for the past 15 years of my life i'm not cooking for myself why the fuck gonna cook for you so i get why you would not want to choose a woman like me to be your wife i i don't really look like a wife either I, i'm pretty i get it thanks to mom and dad shout out to big g but like i am not prim and proper I'm not gonna be a trophy wife okay uh my hair highlights yeah that's the most type of upkeep that i do i don't even shave my legs i go months without shaving my legs so i don't I, I, I am a DJ, okay? Travel the world. I get paid to party. I'm around men. No one's gonna fuck me seriously. No man that wants an ambitious woman. They lie. Women with ambition are women that can't be controlled. You have a voice. Your voice gives an opinion. Men don't like women to have opinions. So in conclusion, amongst a lot of other things, I just feel like I'm gonna be single forever. Not because of me not choosing men, but because men not choosing me. Because clearly... I just don't make the fuck. Hell to the no. To the no, 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 no. Hell no. Congratulations. You've become the man you were looking for. It's just that these women aren't wife material. If you notice, they've already become a man in the relationship. What they want is a wife. They themselves admit they're not wife material. In short, this woman won't contribute anything to a man's life. She'll just be a demanding woman who will keep asking, demanding more every day. Because as they say, 
We men don't like a woman with her own opinion, of course. Because every man is thrilled to marry a bossy woman who doesn't even shave. Wonderful. It's just that every day women seem more useless. It's easier to see a man cooking, doing household chores, than a woman, because every valuable man knows how to be a functioning adult, but they can't even do that. Marrying a woman like this is just a burden, where you'll work harder just to keep her happy, and when you come home married, not even a hot meal awaits you. Man, avoid chaos in your life. <laughs> know that you've said that you cannot teach a man or tell a man how to be a man. So I will not ask you to indict men in this question. But I do want you to speak, Ayanla, to how women need to, uh, I don't know, position ourselves so that we can be in our divinity, so we can have our crowns right, how we can create and not build, when some of us, quite frankly, feel that the men that are available to us, and I'm talking about across the color spectrum, across the age spectrum, trust me, I've done them all, um, they are not positioned to protect nor provide because of some of the statistics we just talked about. They're not earning the incomes. They're not having the resources, and some of them are not even showing up in the leadership. Would you date a bus driver? You. Would you date if a bus If he owns driver? the bus. If he owns no. it, if he owns the bus, See, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's a problem okay. because the standards and requisites, and I'm not talking about him laying on his sofa playing video games all day. <laughs> I'm not talking about mm -hmm. that. But the standards and the criteria that we use to measure men is off for who mm -hmm. we are as women and who they are in this society. I would date a bus driver mm -hmm. if he was if he loved driving the bus. If he was a man of integrity, if he was good to his mama, if he treated me well, I would... It's just never enough with them. Before, a hardworking man with manners and education was enough to be a good prospect. Now, you must have a house, a car, a six-figure job, and to top it off, be six feet tall to deserve to date a woman in her 30s who only offers her presence and comes with a high body count. Then they're surprised when they find themselves single at 40, saying... I have a great job, a nice house, money. Why don't men choose me? They're not chosen because a man isn't interested in your money. He wants to know if you're a woman who will take care of him, who will be a team, who will serve him. Because, as I said, being a good man isn't enough. She doesn't want a team. She wants a wallet, a man who will provide for her, where she doesn't have to bring anything to the table. That's why no matter how much money she has, that woman is never happy. She's bitter, just watching her years pass by without finding a husband. The wall doesn't forgive. Woman, I recommend you get a cat. Hello, happy Friday. Coming at you live from my bathrobe. I have once again no on-camera meetings today and I look crazy, but that is my right as someone who works from home. So I once again just wanted to put the TikTok feelers out. I'm working with a really amazing client in DC. He's 29, super career oriented and looking for women in their 20s who are similarly like ambitious, really passionate about what they do and really driven. I typically work with clients that are 30 plus. So it'd be really amazing to expand my network of women in their like early to mid 20s to late 20s who are really career oriented, driven, intelligent, passionate, looking for the same in a potential partner. If that's you and you hate the DC dating scene and you are looking for just more like quality potential matches, please send me an email or sign up for the link in my bio because I might have a great match for you. And I'd also just love to keep you in mind for the future. That is all. Dating coaches are making a fortune off the loneliness of women. This woman makes a living as a matchmaker finding well-positioned men to pair them with women. It's not a bad idea, I must admit. But when you look at the description of an average man, I see a man who will surely get one or several dates, enjoy each woman he goes out with because it's like on Tinder, high-status men just enjoy all the women. They date as many as they can and none of them offer commitment. That's what a Chad represents, a man who brings nothing to the table except his seat. But just look at the comments on that video, from women saying, choose me, I'm very single, please pick me. It's because women love this man not for his values, but for his wallet. They all want a winner, but they only want to meet him at the finish line. That's why I always say, focus on yourself because that will always pay off. Don't do these things. 12 things that women do to destroy their marriage. Using harsh words. Having unrealistic expectations. Using sarcastic and critical language. Criticizing him in front of your family and friends. 
withholding of affection and physical intimacy, disrespecting his opinions, undermining his authority, but demanding he takes full responsibility. That's a good one. That's a good one. Never being happy, demoralizing him and crushing his spirit, picking the wrong man, focusing on work over the marriage, and cheating. And end up hitting the wall, because the wall doesn't forgive. This woman gives advice on how to be a more traditional wife, how to take care of your husband, but instead of receiving praise, she only receives hatred, because in this matriarchal society, anything that benefits men is frowned upon. Of all the things she said, the most hurtful for men, in my opinion, are using harsh words and having unrealistic expectations. As I've said before, a woman may not hurt you physically, but her words can still sting years later. Many men nowadays fail to reach their full potential because of the women they choose. Many wives demoralize their husbands, insult them, verbally abuse them, or worse, complain about everything, making the man feel like no matter what he does, it will never be enough. That's why the phrase, behind every great man is a great woman, is a fallacy because there are more men destroyed by women than those who are uplifted. We've seen this since the beginning of history, just ask Adam, who paid a higher price than a rib. That's why it's important to choose wisely. If she doesn't serve you, if she doesn't treat you as the best option she could have, get out of there because modern women today are not wife material. So there's this scientific calculation and it's like, the more you run on the treadmill as much as you run that mouth, maybe you wouldn't be built like that. Boy. Let me just say this. The best women in this world are going to be the most difficult and complex. There is no way you are going to find an easy woman that is worth your while. There is just no way. And if you take that difficulty and, and the complex aspect of who she is and turn it into her being crazy, then you need to just go find a basic woman. Because around here, the difficult women are the ones who are going to show the most emotion and pour the most love into you. They're the ones that are going to take a house and make it into a home. They're going to take anything that you give them and multiply it. They're going to provide in that way. They're going to give you children. They're going to give you food to eat. They're going to make a house a home. And it's not going to be easy. The women who are looked at as difficult and complex are the ones who have the most love inside of them to give. And if you can't handle that, once again, go find a basic one. Later on, we'll see the life of this woman, which is truly difficult and complex. You'll see why a woman's past matters and how no woman can determine her own worth. But I am about to embarrass myself on the internet by sharing all the dumb financial decisions that I have made in the pursuit of love. Let's get started with this first one. When I was in my mid-twenties, I was dating a very good-looking man, and he was not into me. But me, being a little anxious, attached girly back in the day, was like, this man is a prize, let me do everything I can to keep him. I was making about twice as much as he made at the time. He had like taken a step back in his career, living with his grandma, so he had no expenses. And mind you, he was still making like 60k a year with no expense. Well, his birthday rolls around and I'm like, I want to take this hot piece to Mexico. I offer that to him and this is how not into me he was. He had to think about that. He had to think about whether or not he wanted to take me up on that offer. Eventually he accepts. I'm like, oh my God, we're in love. A few days before we're set to leave, he's like, you know, I think I want to check about. I was like, okay, let me go check what the prices are. Originally I look and I'm like, oh, I think it's like 50 bucks. Not realizing it was like 75 after taxes and it was 75 each way. So originally I told him, oh, it'll be 50 bucks. And then after going through the checkout process, I'm like, oh, never mind, it was 150. And he goes, well, I was only planning on spending $50. Mind you, I just paid for an entire trip to Mexico for his birthday. Entire trip. I keep expecting him to like be a reasonable person and be like, okay, I got it. I'm the one who wants to check a bag. I'll check it and like, I'll pay the $150. He does not do that. So I went ahead and paid for it. Mm -hmm. Now we go on the trip, have a great time. He tells me he loves me and he breaks up with me a week after we get back. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I take full ownership of this. Me doing these things because I thought I needed to like earn love. But the reason I'm sharing these stories is so that like you can recognize it in your own relationships or just avoid it completely. Because if you think it can't happen to you, let me tell you exactly why it can. Because I was that girl in high school. Tri-star athlete, always in a sport year round. My sports would overlap because I was so good at one sport that I would make it further than normal. So it would overlap with my next season sport. So I'm in two sports at one time, three sports at one time. You know, in order to be on these school teams, you have to maintain your grades and you have to be good in the classroom. And that's exactly what I did. A's and B's, tri-star athlete. Extracurricular activities, good with the teachers, 
socially acceptable. I had a car. I had everything I wanted and needed to succeed. And I was doing that just until almost exactly a year after I graduated high school, almost exactly a year to the day when I had that cap and gown on and threw my hat up in the air with my class, did I end up inside of a jail and then soon after that inside of a prison for armed robbery. May of 2016, I graduated high school. May of 2017, I was behind bars for the first time in my life, clueless, scared, had no idea about the justice system and getting in trouble and any of that sort. And that just comes to show that within less than a year of my life, my whole world flipped upside down. Within less than a year, everything changed for the rest of my life. I am a convicted felon for the rest of my life. And that is going to hinder me and affect me in ways that if you're not a convicted felon, you just have no idea. The guilt that I carry, the shame that I carry. And so, yes, it can happen to you. And don't think for a second that it can't. If you're in high school right now, or if you're a young adult who just graduated high school, and you may think that maybe you're not going down the right path. Maybe you're starting to experience drugs and the party life, or you're hanging around the wrong crowd and they like to play with guns and they like to do some hood rat. Trust me, been there, done that. A lot of us have. Some didn't get caught. Some been, been through this years ago. And now they're different. They didn't have to go to prison for that, but I did. I did. I had to go to prison. This is my mod. I had to be locked up to be set free because within less than a year, something in my life changed so drastically that if I would not have gone to jail or prison, I would have ended up dead. Yes, it can happen to you. Tell me why I'm at work and I work with models and there was this beautiful, beautiful model, right? And we're shooting her and I'm like, girl, how old are you? She tells me she's 32. When I tell you my job was to the floor, she looked 23. Like, I literally looked at her and I was like, girl, did you graduate last year? Because same. She looked so young. She looked so good. She was glowing. I asked her, what's the secret? Like, what do you do? She goes, you know what? I have a man that loves me, takes care of me, treats me right, and he does not stress me out. She said, when a man stresses you out, girl, you're going to age. I had never heard something so right in my life. If a man is taking care of you well, you are going to glow. Like you have no stress. You have no crusty, dusty, musty sun stressing you out. Like if anything, he's making your life better and easier. You look good. Because when he's stressing you out, girl, we know. We can see it. Because trust me, we've been there. We've been there. So for the first time since November of 2017, when I was sentenced to prison for the very first time in my life, I am going to read the plea that I wrote for the judge, basically my mercy call right before I was sentenced to prison in front of my family and everyone else in the courtroom. It was my mom, my grandma, my grandpa, my stepdad. My brother wasn't there. He was in Afghanistan. So if you want to set the mood for yourself and get ready, I'm going to uh, read this to you as if I, uh, you guys were the judge. Your Honor, when I graduated high school in May of 2016, it marked the biggest accomplishment of my life thus far. But a year later, May 2017, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I don't know what word best describes what I'm feeling. Regret, ashamed, remorseful. I'm not mad at anyone but myself. I'm so angry that I let myself get to this point, but I don't blame anybody but myself. Before evil corrupted my life, I was a young girl with aspirations to succeed in a world with no limits. But then I quickly became part of a world in which I was immensely limited. I refuse to allow this to define me, though. And anyone who does know me know that this was a mistake made well out of my character. As I was growing up, I was taught to take responsibility for my own actions. And it's about time I was given this respectful opportunity to say right now that I am here because I messed up. I can say all day that I hung around bad influences and I can even say I've witnessed some very poor decision making, but what I can't say is that I didn't have a choice because I did. I have two legs that could have walked away, but for whatever reason, 
these two feet stayed put. At some point, I lost sight of who I truly am. I remember my sophomore year of high school when I was chosen by our district representative, Travis Cummings, to work in our state capitol. And at one point, I was able to participate in a mock trial in a courtroom just like this, but bigger. I remember thinking, I'm going to pursue a career just like this one day. I did not expect the next time that I stood in a courtroom, it would be dressed like this, bound by all of my failures. I can't even begin to process what has been going through the heads of my teachers, families, or coaches. Some of them sitting, listening as I speak, and yet they still cannot grasp what they see. These shackles controlling the lengths of my steps, these handcuffs enabling me to reach around my mom and beg her to forgive me for this mess that I put myself in. I remember being in high school like it was just a year ago, and that's probably because it was just a little over a year ago. I was one of the fastest swimmers on the team, one of the fastest runners on the track, and having so much potential to succeed at a higher level through athletics and academics. But instead, I went from a cap and gown to stripes and shackles. I went from an 18-year-old girl with her own apartment, car, an amazing job taking care of infants to absolutely nothing. Now, I'm going to stop there and tell you guys to come back for part two. I've been divorced since 2017, and today I had to recall something from my old life, as I call it. So when we were married, he was in the Virginia retirement system. And during the lifetime of our marriage, I get half of his retirement funds. Well, we've never split that up. So we've decided to go ahead and start doing that. And in order to do that, you have to hire a lawyer and you have to go through what's called a quadro. So it actually goes to the courts and they have to approve this and we have to send in like our divorce decree and it's a big pain in the butt and it costs a lot of money. So we're in the middle of doing that and the lawyer's office called me today and asked me for my social security number and his social security number. Can you explain to me why I still know his social security number just as easily as I know mine? Like why? When is this going to stop? Guess what? Going on a date. So I'm in California. So yes, my hair is flat. One of the few benefits of being out here. And I kind of got a cute little outfit on. Um, Going to see how these Cali boys measure up to some of them that I've been trying to date in other cities. Um, Yeah, I'm just not real sure about this. But you know, what are we going to do? gotta put yourself out there and sometimes you win sometimes you lose and most of the time it feels like I've lost but hey um let's see how it goes (laughs) hi hello it's me (laughs) so this morning I'm just gonna get right into it I'm just gonna get right into it this morning we had a meeting at the school for our oldest son. And so me and my ex are there together. You know, we're co-parenting and us. we're doing a great job. We walk in together, united front, and we come out. And we're getting in our vehicles. We're like, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about this later, blah, blah, blah. And my car won't start. The minivan, the minivan. Start. And I'm like, what the fuck? Well, you see, there's this notification that's been going on off for like probably a month that says change key fob battery. And I ignored it. And so today I, had to have my ex take me to the store and help me change my key fob battery. And you know, this mother, you tell TikTok that you had to call me for something today. Okay, this is a call out to all my girls over 50 and single, especially if you've been married a long time, because getting out there is like, holy what is going on. So here are my top tips on what to do and how to find your soulmate. Number one, get a coach, get a mentor, get a therapist. I went to therapy for two straight years. One of the smartest things I ever did. Number two, start to read some books, take a course, like start pouring over things that are going to help you learn as much you can. Um, number three, like literally what is your part in the relationship? Like own your stuff. All right. What is the theme? What do you keep attracting? Who are they? Uh, Number four, you need to figure out what's healthiest for you, not what you want. I told my therapist, oh, I want a man that stands in in his power. I think she was laughing her ass at me, okay? Because those men are usually narcissists. I really needed a man that was loving, that was kind, that was consistent, and that made me feel safe. And, And 
There you go. I first told people that my ex-husband and I were getting divorced and that beyond that, we were making this effort to have a really collaborative, pleasant divorce and we were gonna split the farm so we could both live here and the kids could stay on the farm and the kids could run back and forth and we were gonna do holidays together. And when I described the situation that we have here, there were three things that I heard all the time. The first was that I was never going to find someone as amazing as Derek. The second was that there was no way this was gonna work that we were both gonna be able to live here, that we were gonna get along, that this was gonna be like a healthy situation for anyone. And then third, that even if we could do it, when we started dating people, it would never work. That we would never find partners that were on board with this plan. To those things, I would say that even if I was alone forever, it was better to be lonely alone than lonely in a relationship. But aside from that, I actually did very much believe that Derek and I both would be capable of finding people who were much better fits for us uh, and we would be much healthier and much happier with. But beyond that, even if it didn't happen, not really a point. Two, that we were absolutely capable of making this work because we were doing the work to make it work. And three, neither one of us were gonna date anyone who wasn't okay with this, so that was never going to be an issue. And I believe that people would be okay with it. I really strive to be humble to the point that I am studying humility <laughs> for my dissertation research, getting a PhD. Uh, I deeply believe in the importance and the power of humility and so I try really hard when I'm wrong and I realize I'm wrong to own that and to recognize it and have conversations about that because I think it is, it's important, right? To let people know when they are right and you are wrong and you have misjudged a situation. I also try not to say I told you so when I am right because usually someone realizes it and that is enough satisfaction for me. But yesterday, it was a Sunday morning, I was sitting in my backyard, it was our first real cold fall morning here. My ex-husband's girlfriend drove the golf cart over to my house and so she and I were sitting in the backyard together watching the kids play while we drank our coffee by the fire. The day before, she and I had had a girls day with my daughter where we took her together to get our nails done, which is something she and I do often together even without my daughter, but this time she got to go. And then we went and got my daughter's ears pierced and it was like a whole big exciting thing. They watched the kids for me while I had to go figure out like cell phone stuff before a trip that I'm going on. The day before that, she rode with me and the kids into town where we met my ex-husband who go to the university homecoming parade for the afternoon and then we all went to our friends houses together to hang out and have dinner uh, while we were doing that she and I were going over our plan for Thanksgiving and for Christmas because her family is coming here for Thanksgiving and she's staying here for Christmas and so we're going to have all four of our families together with the kids who have never in four years spent a holiday or birthday having like double of them apart from their parents we have done all of them together and there is something so satisfying about all of that. One, because our life is amazing. But two, this just feels like all the time I'm walking around and I just want to be like, I told y'all so. Like, I told you so. Like, we have done it. And our life is freaking amazing and beautiful. So this is going to be the one time I unapologetically say I told you freaking so. And also if you were one of those people I know that you like meant well and you were just scared and you were worried for us and whatever but next time trust me when I tell you something will work because this has freaking worked. I don't know man it seems like she put in a lot of effort. They have a lot of effort to make it work with somebody else versus those two. Like we're putting in a lot of work to make it go forward with two different families versus us just being one family. That's just the way that I see it. I'm not sure what went on. It doesn't seem like she said what happened or why they didn't want to be together. But that, I mean, you know, you can't really say I told you so when something didn't work out and something else is working out. Like the first thing that was supposed to work out is not working out. I mean, it seems like you're once again, putting more effort into making this work to tell everybody I told you so <laughs> versus just saying, you know what? Let's take a step back and see if there's something else that we can do to remain dedicated to this thing that we have going on now versus trying to find somebody else and make it work with somebody else. That's the way I see it from my perspective.